Okay, I think we're starting now. Can you, everybody hear me okay? Should I turn it up a little bit? A little bit. All right, hold up. I'll be right back. <laughs> Hopefully that's better. Oh yeah, that sounds a bit better already. Okay, so hi, my name is Michelle. I'm one of the booksellers here at Third Place Books. And tonight we have some local writers for you. This is really exciting. We love doing this at their place books, especially just like having really local people coming out and sharing their stuff in their own community. Um, so first of all, I should say that on your chairs and at our signing table too, we have these little coupons for you. They are good throughout the night. If you'd like to bring a drink over from the bar or have some dessert later, some dinner later, have 20% off. They are for you. So thank you for coming. Um, also, um, we have copies of the anthology here tonight, book two and some book one up here as well. Um, any purchases tonight are greatly appreciated. Not only do they support an independent bookstore, but also your community, the writers, the people around you. Um, it gives them, I guess, recognition and also the means to keep going and doing their work. Um, and if, but if you would like to buy a book tonight, you can feel free to have it signed over here. We have a signing table set up to your left. Um, and then uh, purchases can be made on your way out as you pass the register. Um, and while you're up there, feel free to sign up for our email updates or check out our book clubs. We uh, pick up a calendar. Our October calendar is orange. We will have a November one coming soon. You can also find our complete uh, calendar of events at thirdplacebooks.com as well. Please silence any electronic devices. Cool, great. So people are doing that. Excellent, thank you. And we'll get started here pretty soon. Um, so tonight we are very glad to have six of the contributors featured in South Seattle Emerald Anthology, Emerald Reflections 2. We had a book one's um, event here maybe two years ago, I want to say, and it was, it was really exciting to see the community come out. Um, and it's like this are some of my favorite, giving a platform to local writers. It means a lot to me, and it clearly means a lot to you guys, too, to come out on a rainy Thursday evening. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the news and culture sites, that's seattleemerald.com. I won't talk too much about that because I think Anthony is going to in a moment. Um, and um, so actually, you know what, please help me to welcome Anthony Shukraft to the stage where he will introduce the writers tonight. introduction. Um, my name is Anthony Shoecraft. I'm very proud to stand in front of you uh, as the very proud husband to Kim, father to Zion and Keita, and a very proud public servant. Gotta give the family a shout out because they couldn't join me tonight. Um, but I'm also proud to stand before you as probably one of the most proud native sons of what I consider to be the crown jewel of this city. That's the South End. Yeah. Stand up, South End. Shout out. Yeah. There you go. All right. <laughs> um, but I'm also a very proud uh, admirer, uh, passionate fan of what I consider to be one of the finest institutions in this community, and that's the South Seattle Emerald. So uh, just very honored to be asked by the Emerald to introduce tonight's readers and just offer a few words. Um, I have the privilege of welcoming you all to tonight's event, which is a collaboration between the Emerald, Bird Volta Press, and then also Third Place Books, uh, Seward Park. And you know, tonight isn't just a celebration of uh, Emerald Reflections Part Two, the anthology that comprises just beautiful poetry, um, magnificent writings um, that are originally published in the Emerald and now co collected by. Um, Vlad Verano of uh, Burke Walter Press. Um, but it's also just a night to just celebrate 
the extraordinary existence uh, that this part of the city represents, that is the south end of Seattle. Um, this, you know, this part of town, um, as a very proud native son, just has an extraordinary uh, place in this city's history. And when you're from here, you just have a particularly unique relationship to the soil that we're standing on right here. And um, but this place is, a, is an area and is a community home to just extraordinary and divine uh, complexity, treasured relationships, and it's where you find a multi-dimensionality of people's narratives. That also includes their beautiful vulnerabilities, their strengths, and this is a part of town where you encounter a lot of local trailblazers, a lot of world changers, and a lot of people who just simply ordinary, everyday people that struggle, do the right thing, to push us to close the gap between our rhetoric and our actions. So tonight, I'm very just privileged again to honor this event, an event that we'll hear um, uh, from Anthology, um, I'm sorry, from uh, Reflections Part Two. Um, the, re the, the, sorry, uh, he he hear from some of the um, contributors to Reflections Part Two, um, which I'll say really quickly, I know Marcus and Amber will kill me if I don't say this. Um, as you all can see, as Michelle mentioned, uh, Reflections Part Two is here for purchase. $15.99 for the generous tippers, $16. <laughs> um, but it gives me extraordinary pleasure to uh, get out in front of you and let the real uh, honorees of tonight, the contributors to Reflections Part Two, come before you, and I have the esteemed pleasure to introduce them. Um, first, I will say uh, it gives me a great honor to announce my dear brother, someone who's also a treasure, uh, my dear brother Alvin L.A. Horn. Brother Horn will be reading tonight, In Tune With You. Following Brother Horn will be Riley Williams, reading Steers and Queers. Next we have Nakia Isabel, who will be performing Dear America. Followed by Tiffany Jones, who will be reading Free Seattle Spring. Next we'll hear Marilee Jolin, the Emerald's first and great executive director. She'll be reading Re White Silence is Golden. And then la lastly, we will hear from none other than our dear brother, someone who I consider a national treasure in this community, the very dear Marcus Harrison Green, who will be reading, Woo. shout out, <laughs> Brother Marcus. Um, Right. Yeah. 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 Gotta celebrate each other. Brother, Brother Harrison will be reading. Sorry, let's go. Brother Harrison. That's not a character, brother. Um, but he'll be reading to Absent Friends for the Trail Williams. And with that, I hand the stage over to Brother Alvin. Please join me in giving Brother Alvin a hand. I'm a native son, grew up here in the Seward Park area, going back to the 60s. So I've seen this neighborhood change. I've uh, Columbia City Theater. Used to see uh, the movie uh, Sound of Music. And then a few years later, I was watching Superfly. So uh, I've been around, I went to Granite Beach High School, played sports there, it sent me to college, and then onward. To over to that place that makes airplanes, but I uh, wasn't satisfied with what I was doing. And I was always been a writer, a poet, vocalist, arts and entertainment. Eventually, I ended up teaching, and um, since you know, oh, I have more cases in my daycare. You write. Uh, you guys keep reading when you come in here, so I keep reading. Um, years later, I have. Um, Eight published books now? Yeah. One was nominated for the you know, NWC uh, Image Award. A couple of New York bestsellers. So, uh, happy to be home and still be in my book. But first, I was a poet. 
good thing that I write with metaphors. I love your B sharp. I like your G minor. Even when it's a little uncertain in the groove, it makes me sing low and slow and hum. Amplification. Wanting to be your hip hop and lift you up when the country and western has you in tears. Your E flat seven sometimes is erratic in the melody and it confuses me. It's not smooth jazz and it's not avant-garde jazz, which I do better with, but even then, that long silent space, you know, I need rhyme and reason and rhythm to dance. Oh uh, yeah, your C major can make me want to get horizontal and vertical with you. Although I want to play your F, I know I can rock it and remember every nuance and I can take you to the bridge and vamp on the one to dance and dance, but your C clef needs to meet my bass clef in the middle so we can orchestrate a more effective clef. I would love to have your A augmented knife walk through <laughs> Then I can enjoy the flow of the B sharp, sixth, seventh, and ninth. Then I can play all your notes and funk you and spread you into being in harmony with my soul. coming here, um, yeah. or any experience I had with Seattle, so slightly different perspective. Um, I do want to say that because I wrote this a couple years ago, in the summer of 2016, um, it has a little bit of a, an optimistic bent about the way the world is going <laughs> with respect to uh, social issues. So obviously the world's changed since then, uh, and this might not resonate as clearly in that department but I decided to leave it and read it as is because I think that the positive message is at least as if not more important. So this is called Steers and Queers. My name is Raleigh and I'm a bisexual man in my late 20s. It's taken me a long time to say that with any confidence at all. If you're wondering how long, I'll give you a hint, somewhere in the late 20s. Uh, <laughs> in today's world, living in Seattle, you might wonder what the hell took so long. Uh, was he conservative? Was he, what was he afraid of? Did he experiment in college and adopt a new identity? Um, the reality is frustratingly stereotypical and indicative of the power patriarchy has over all of us. Uh, it was a happy ending though, I promise. We'll get there. I grew up in a small Texas town where the all-encompassing importance of high school football was rivaled only by Christianity. And I'm not talking about the diet Jesus y'all have up here with the pride flag displayed alongside the stained glass that says all are welcome. Uh, I'm talking about the Southern Baptist, every word in the Bible is true, you will burn in hell forever, Jesus. Uh, imagine Friday Night Lights meets Jesus Camp and you're almost back. <laughs> I went to the same Christian private school as Ted Cruz. So you can imagine it wasn't an extremely welcoming environment uh, for us queers. In fact, uh, avoiding getting smeared was a real part of life for many people. Um, sexual deviance wasn't even a requirement for patriarchal violence. Simply diverting from the deeply entrenched gender norms that cover every single word choice, item of clothing, posture, social interaction, was plenty to inspire corrective action. It was in this world that I went through puberty and struggled to figure out who I was. Luckily for me, I was an athletic white guy, 
So there's a very privileged box that I could mostly jam myself into if I bent a little and tried really hard not to break. Um, and here's where our story gets painfully paradigmatic. You know the super jock who performed perfect masculinity and helped to enforce those norms on those around him in order to compensate for uh, something? Yeah, that was me. Uh, I don't remember myself as a bully, uh, but there are others that might feel differently. Performing a 16-year-old's extreme idea of masculinity is hard to do without hurting people, uh, both physically and emotionally. I'm still pretty ashamed of the way that I treated many of the young men and women that were a part of my life. Uh, I try to be kind to myself now and say that I didn't know any better, which is true, I didn't. Uh, I was doing what I thought I was supposed to do. Uh, when I treated my sexual partners like objects, or when I defined, defended my pride with violence. I was being man, the best I knew how to be. Understanding now why I was that way, and even having some sympathy for my younger self, doesn't make the pain I caused any less real. Uh, I promised a happy ending, right? Not quite there yet. <laughs> like any good Texan, I internalized all of these hurtful norms, uh, of course, I realized relatively early how wrong they were, and I changed my mind, but it's much more complicated than that. I knew intellectually that it was okay that you know other people are gay, and I knew that all people should be treated with respect, and I knew all, I knew all these things, but the damage done to my views of the world went much deeper. Hatred, bigotry, or any other bogus view that is learned young and reinforced at every turn is like a tumor made of glass. The day you realize it's falsity, it shatters. It takes years though to dig each little shard out of your body. Um, and each one is hard, painful work, and there always seems to be more. I stole that metaphor from someone. I can't remember who. <laughs> Almost definitely a woman. <laughs> <laughs> it took many years of excruciating and sometimes embarrassing public surgeries before I was able to finally admit that I found men attractive. Never mind that I've been hooking up with them since I could drive. Uh, each one of those early experiences was carefully repressed and kept secret from everyone around me until they weren't. Um, eventually, news of one of my encounters did get around and caused me a bit of a dilemma. I lost friends, I got prank calls, I definitely lost status amongst my athlete friends. I survived though. In fact, I had performed my heterosexuality so garishly that most people dismissed my secret as an unfounded rumor. I'm sure the privilege that I used in pretty much every other area helped quite a bit too. This, like everything else, it would likely include a few more degrees of difficulty if I wasn't a cis white male. Eventually, high school ended, and I shipped off to Seattle for college. Uh, I was a culture shock at first, but I fell in love with Seattle. I won't go into detail here because you probably know more about the city than I do, but it was pretty different from the rural heaven hole that spawned me. Uh, specifically, I was allowed, encouraged, and even forced sometimes to come out of the stupid box that I crawled into. After a few years, I found myself surrounded by a loving community that welcomed my true self and actively helped me to understand who I really was. At this point in my life, I still identified as straight, even though I had pretty regular sex with men. And that's the shitty part about harmful social norms. Uh, they work even when other people stop enforcing them because they live inside you. Um, I'm a very masculine person, and in my innermost core, I couldn't square that with being a person that was attracted to men. So it took you know, several more years of unpacking, therapy, support from my community, and I finally admitted to myself that I was bi. Uh, that was by far the hardest step for me. Pretty soon after, I came out to my friends and my coworkers and the rest of Seattle, and that went as smoothly as I could have hoped for, um, as did coming out to my least conservative non-Texan family members. Um, I finally felt like I was becoming myself, and I was loved. Um, and I can't say how thankful, um, I can't say enough how thankful I am to everyone that supported me on that journey. Uh, of course, the next step in the story is coming out to my Texan family and friends, which 
I debated whether or not to do, whether or not it was even worth it for another couple of years, and it weighed pretty heavily on me. And there are so many reasons come out that smarter people than me have already made very clear, but my specific experience in Texas had led me to had not let me believe that it would go, <clears throat> that it would go well. Eventually, I decided the burden should be on anyone who had a problem with it, and not on me. Starting with the last boss, I called my mom and loaded it out. Commence holding breath for three, two, one. That must have been really difficult for you to tell me, she said with an almost hilarious sense of self-awareness. Um, rare treat. Um, all in all, she took it okay. She disagrees but she loves me and whatever. We don't talk about it much, but we still talk. Um, I also came out to my high school sports team, and you know what? They did just fine. They were curious and a bit out of their element, but in the end, we're still my friends and held true to my favorite Texan value. Do whatever you want, just let me do what I want. <laughs> so here's your happy ending. Seattle was liberal enough to drag me out of my box. And even though Texas was responsible for building that box in the first place, things are changing. <clears throat> when, I <laughs> when I showed back up with no box in sight, they shrugged and passed me a beer. I don't know if that sounds like a big deal to anybody else, but for me it was life-changing. And it also gives me so much hope. Even in this crazy world where the extremists are the loudest, things are getting better. Keep up the good work, y'all. Dear America, and I'm a mentor uh, with the organization called Friends of the Children of Seattle. One of my youth is here with me today, who's a poet in her own right. But um, after Kaepernick made his decision to kind of like kneel and all the backlash that he got from it, I just felt in my, within my, my power and my platforms, what can I do? And how can I write something that exemplifies my frustration, not only dealing with the systems, but also answering the young people that I serve in today. So um, this is called Dear America. I'm gonna sing in the beginning and at the end, so don't be alarmed. <laughs> Come on. Land of the free, but home of the slaves. I just wanna be free. I don't want the blame. These systems try to weigh us down. These systems, they want to keep us bound. America, dear America, America, dear America. Dear America, I want you to know that all lives matter, so yes, that includes the black lives too. And no need to get defensive, but please listen to hear and not to speak of your ignorance. Our mothers, fathers, and children are crying while our corpse hit the pavement, bang, bang, pop. You pulled the trigger again because of your trained fear. It's these systems, so you ask why Kaepernick doesn't reverence your flag, but I ask why don't you admire his response to injustice? See, I'm tired of the excuses you use to justify the crime that our very law prohibits. So stop allowing your indecisive, unpredictable emotions to fill our fellow citizens, to kill our fellow citizens. Impulsive emotion can be destructive. Don't you remember that race is a man-made concept? To give power to one group and to control others? Can't you see that you are just repeating painful cycles of history that are dividing and not uniting us, and let's make America great again. When were we ever great and equitable? What would you like me to tell the youth I serve every day? I can't justify your actions as they see themselves, their brothers, their sisters, mothers and fathers become your target. And we wanted to stop, but I wonder if you will ever choose to listen sincerely the people. America, land of the free, 
the home of the slave. I just want to be free. I don't want to pay. Uh, these systems try to weigh us down. These systems, they want to keep us bound. America, dip up America. and continuous today, an unjust wall blocking out the warm sun, trying to pluck the love and life out of me in a way, a warning telling me to gather my things and run. There's nothing for me to do. I stand there paralyzed and let the light swallow me into. The dark is condescending, beckoning me with its shadows. This numbness hurts, it has no feeling. How could I ever leave without feeling shallow? For being so alone, not helping or willing? There's nothing for me to do. I stand there paralyzed and let the black swallow me in two. The bright rainbows are attacking me, no longer dim or dull. The sudden rush of colors is blinding to see. They come at me, rage like an aggravated boy. There is nothing for me to do. I stand there paralyzed and let the colors swallow me in two. The words try to bring me back. They take the, they take the tears, wipe them dry, place the smiles that I like. There's nothing for me to do. I can move once again. But the depression has finally been removed. And I am free, just like you. Yes. Come on. from a place of ignorance about a certain essential part of American history in this essay, who I'm happy to say, mostly thanks to Marcus, sorry, I don't need that at all, I don't know why I had it, uh, I now am far more educated about, so there's your, there's your intro. This is titled, White Silence Can Be Golden. On Saturday night, I had the distinct privilege of attending Spectrum Dance Theater's production of A Rap on Race. The script is an adaptation of the 1970 recorded conversation between poet and author James Baldwin and anthropologist Margaret Mead. <clears throat> Baldwin, portrayed by local Tony Award winning choreographer Dan Donald Byrd, and Mead, played by actress Julie Briskman, sit on a raised platform discussing race in America, their tense and powerful conversation reflected in the evocative movements of the superb dancers below them. Going in, I had no idea what to expect from this theater experience. I knew little of the real lives of the two characters, having vaguely heard Mead's name, but woefully innocent of Baldwin's literary legacy. Would I be lost without the requisite knowledge of these people? No. In fact, from the moment the two American legends opened their mouths, I found myself in the midst of a very familiar and eerily modern-sounding conversation. This familiarity was both illuminating and disturbing. I can't help but ask with shock and disappointment, are we really at the same place in the discussion of race as in 1970? Have we not progressed in 46 years? Over the course of the 80 minute performance, Baldwin and Mead fall into a well-worn pattern with Baldwin trying to convey the exiling and intolerable experience of being black in the United States, while Mead attempts to exonerate herself from blame and moving quickly past Baldwin's pain, focus the conversation on the future. After a particularly intense exchange in which Meade dismisses Baldwin's suffering by focusing on her internal beliefs, Bird finally exclaims, 
We've got to make some connection between what you believe and what I've endured. In hearing that sentence, a light bulb went on for me. The use of those two words, belief and experience, illuminated a white person problem that has been plaguing me for months and, you know, our country forever. I realized just how great a distance exists between what white people believe and what people of color have endured. I realized how much white people sabotage opportunities for true connection by focusing on our beliefs and knowledge at the expense of the lived experience of people of color. The reality is this. People of color have experienced racism and white people have not. Indeed, we cannot. The very nature of racism and power is that those in power cannot experience it, which leaves us with only knowledge. And when it comes to racism, I am coming to believe more and more strongly knowledge is not enough. Without personal experience, our knowledge is at best incomplete and at worst quite damaging. This is an inadequate illustration, but bear with me. A few hours after the birth of my first daughter, you sit right there, I asked to see a lactation specialist. To my utter shock, the person who showed up to help me learn how to breastfeed was a man. I flat out refused, told him we were fine and we didn't need help. This was a lie. My daughter was not eating and I was scared. But I couldn't stomach the idea of a man trying to help me with this uniquely female, decidedly intimate process. I'm sure he possessed plenty of helpful knowledge, but him knowing about breastfeeding was of no interest to me in that moment. I needed a connection with someone who had experienced it. I don't mean to imply in any way that breastfeeding and racism are the same or to conflate them in any way. Still, the analogy resonates with me. The amount of distaste and anger I felt toward that male lactation specialist was infinitesimal compared to the fury people of color must experience when white people show up to conversations about racism with our detached, abstract, and rational knowledge. Mm -hmm. By focusing on what we believe, we are failing to make the connection Baldwin called for. To truly build this necessary connection, we must wrap our heads around the limits of knowledge and stop trying to share our opinions on racism with people of color. We must recognize that our knowledge is deeply inferior to POC and experience, and, ch and our championing of such knowledge harms our relationships and alienates us from the people with whom we most need to connect. What then can we do? Well, here are a few ideas to get you started. Attend an undoing institutional racism training. The People's Institute for Survival and Beyond regularly connects undoing institutional, conducts undoing institutional racism trainings in Seattle, and these trainings should be considered required coursework for all white people, in my opinion. The skilled facilitators at undoing institutional racism trainings expertly draw on history, sociology, personal experience, and the experiences of the participants to create a safe but challenging environment that enlightens while it humbles, plants seeds with immense potential, and builds relationships for further work. If you care about issues of race, this is an essential step. Shut off the damn internet and meet some real life people. Nothing can compare to personal interaction with other people, particularly when it comes to questions of race. I'm sure there are many different groups having these discussions near you. Churches, libraries, schools. European Descent is a great organization that offers opportunities for white people to meet and discuss race. Take those 15 minutes you might put toward crafting a killer Facebook comment and use them instead to invite someone to talk in person about such things. This, I think, is the most important. And I gotta give some credit to Ben Hunter for this one in the back. Don't offer your opinion. When in conversation about race and something gets your hackles up and you feel like you have to add something, try saying instead, tell me more about that. And then really listen. Don't interrupt. In fact, stay silent much longer than is comfortable. When in doubt, say, tell me more. You might be surprised what you learn not only about racism, but also about yourself. I also recommend going to see Baldwin and Mead. Of course, it's, you can't, you can't anymore. It's done. It was really good. Uh, <laughs> a wrap on race plays through May 22nd. You won't regret it. And I promise you won't regret holding your opinions to yourself either. We all have a lot to learn, and when it comes to racism, we white people have way more to learn than others. And the only way to do it, the only way to build Baldwin's meaningful connection, is to get over our own beliefs and listen wholeheartedly to people of color's experience. How's everybody doing tonight? Thank you for coming out. Um, 
I've heard it said once that you can guarantee a great event if you are the least talented person a part of it. And, uh, so this is definitely a great event, I must say. Uh, um, just thank you so much for being here. Thank you uh, to my managing editor at Seattle Times, Michelle Mateus Flores, for allowing me to be here tonight. She doesn't loan me out anymore to just any publication. So I, I don't know what deal you worked out to get the Emerald, but they can't talk crap about. Okay, okay. The Emerald can't talk crap about the Seattle Times for three months or something. Is that what, what are they going to write about? Oh. Um, no, but. Uh, uh, it's, it's ironic uh, that I'm reading the essay I'm reading today. Uh, uh, earlier today I was out um, doing a story and a young man, um, he uh, said, you're with the Emeralds, you have, a, you have a legacy, he said. And I thought a lot about that word. Because um, I used to have this superficial understanding of legacy. Uh, I thought it was the street corners that were named after you, or the words and quotes that you had written down and that people would attribute to you um, are some statue. And uh, begin to realize how ephemeral those things are, and how transitory. Mm -hmm. So you begin to realize how much legacy really is an exercise in love. Um, I thought about that with, uh, so, cause I say that I'm about to read about my friend on the trail, um, how much how much has love uh, guided me to become a better person in life? And um, I can't tell you uh, how much that's meant to me. I've um, been fortunate enough to have so many people who have uh, guided me with their love to becoming a better person. Um, some of them are in this room, but uh, uh, he was the first. And um, so we'd like to tell you a little bit about my friend. And I'd also like to point out that uh, his beautiful mother, Linda, um, his wonderful son, Chuck Jr., are here today. Um, thank you for allowing me to honor your father and to honor your son. Um, so with that, to absent friends on the trip. Childhood officially ends the moment you learn your friend was murdered. Before then, Regardless of how many years spent bumbling around the spinning rock, there still exists a faith in the resiliency of tomorrows. Your heart still clutches tightly to the adolescent conviction that tomorrow's arrival carries with it hope and luminous possibilities to vanquish whatever darkness engulfs you today. But that belief evaporates once you hear the person you roamed high school hallways with, the person who helped you as an awkward loner endure a terrible high school experience, the person who helped you persist in your seemingly delusional passion for writing died before his time, killed just a mile from your home. I found out yesterday that my high school classmate, Latrell Williams, was identified as the victim in the fatal shooting that took place Tuesday night near the Lake Ridge neighborhood. Latrell's fatal shooting was one of three to take place in South King County in a week span, receiving scant attention from our political leadership. Speculation coming from local television stations and neighborhood social media groups and next door haven alike followed the typical scripts reenacted whenever a black male is killed in a shooting in the South. Mm -hmm. It must be a gang thing. The victim himself was probably a gangbanger or a thug or a homeless person in a dispute over drugs. The usual monikers are painted on an unknown murdered black man. His life now a blank canvas colored in by an ignorant perception. Initially, I gave only a passing thought about the shooting, caught up in the frenzy of a news cycle, continuously vomiting up one dismal tale after the next. My shame came from recognizing that I too had originally dismissed this as just another sad tragedy. A story that happens too often, because I, like the others, had casually reduced the life of who I thought was an unknown person to a stereotype. And while I can't speak to every aspect of his life, I can testify to those I knew. The trail was anything but stereotypical. My mind went back to our high school days. Like me, Latrell was a black South Seattle grad student exported to a predominantly white affluent school. Unlike me, he had the genetic jackpot. As a star running back our senior year, his muscles seemed constantly pregnant. 
about to give birth to one another. <laughs> Black Hercules, the L train. The trail looked like the love child of granite and titanium. <laughs> Despite his talent for athletics, we aligned because we were still two people who never wholly seemed to fit in. Unable to completely give away all of ourselves to an atmosphere that rejected a large chunk of our personas. Each year, I did my best to exhaust every absence I could from school I dreaded attending each year. I counted down every minute until the clock hit 2.30 p.m., bringing the sweet salvation of the dismissal bell and the reprieve it brought from the shame of being black and poor. But the trail made my captivity there bearable. The star running back would sit at the cafeteria table with me. Right at the exact moment, I began thinking I had been placed in a contagion because no one dared come within a 10-foot radius of me. Naturally like Connick, every word he spoke had purpose. He used them to convince a 120-pound, rail-thin, five-foot-nothing <laughs> to join the football team during my final year of high school. Come on, come on. I've, I've grown an inch since then. <laughs> <laughs> as much as I hate to admit it, that was the best experience of my high school years. Mm. It was how he persuaded me to continue showing up to class after I had been warned that one more absence would have resulted in me automatically failing the year. I had the bright idea to simply stop showing up to school so my parents would be forced to let me finish out high school elsewhere. It's how he got me out of the trouble all of those times I was busy, do, busy doing every single one of those lurid things teenagers swear up and down to their parents that they're not doing, but of course are. It was how he persuaded me to finally enjoy a little bit of my experience at a high school I spent three and a half years hating with the raw intensity of a thousand white hot suns. He rarely smiled as he seemed to always be navigating his place in the school and the world, along with his future's course as a football recruit. But still fixed in my mind is the one he laid on me during our graduation as he was named the Athlete of the Year. Though he was looking out at all of us, I kept thinking it was directed at me, saying in his typical, understated way, you South End boys, man. Our paths diverged after high school. He went off to play football at Montana State, and I went to California Dreaming in Los Angeles. But they converged again, though, when I returned to Seattle, giving up one fantasy to pursue another. I began bumping into them almost every day at the Rainier Beach Library. It was the only office space I could afford in the early days of the Emerald. He would be, be there just as religiously working on scripts for a show he had in mind to produce one day. And our friendship was rekindled. We talked about our shared craft of storytelling, contrasting our chosen mediums. His love for the visual was matched by mine for the written word. For that, he had my kinship, but he had my respect for the fight he was undertaking. He shared with me his long, protracted custody battle for his son that had lasted for more than a year. I remember thinking then, the same thoughts as I do today, that in a world where black men are constantly maligned for being absentee fathers to the detriment of their families, here was the trail determined and obsessed with He was obsessed with reuniting with his 12-year-old son, no matter the cost in money or time. He would keep me regularly updated on the progress or lack thereof, and we'd encourage each other to show up every day to chip away at our dreams. We struggled and strived and survived in those early days when our dreams seemed to be unable to escape to be relevant, and failure seemed inevitable. But the words lifted my spirit as they had a decade earlier when he told me whether sprinting, walking, or crawling, just keep moving forward. Months of Sundays had passed since we saw each other. And childhood really is gone, and with it a re reliance on tomorrow's grace to speak words foolishly delayed. But he never waited to speak the ones I needed to hear. And I wish I hadn't reserved my own in thanking him for feeding a scrawny kid the leaf who previously feasted on a steady diet of doubt. I wish I had capitalized on our shared present to express gratitude for steering a reckless teenager's destiny away from the treacherous hazards along life's turnpike. I wish I would have said, I love you, Petra. But as you once told me, it's never too late to do what needs doing.
do just want to give a hearty thank you to everybody who read. Um, just blessing um, me and, and everyone um, here with their brilliance. If we get another round of applause for them. Yeah. Um, thank you to Anthony Shoecraft, our wonderful host with the most. Um, yeah, Vlad Verano, who, who made Emerald Reflections 2, uh, what it is, literally, uh, um, and yeah, uh, I know that my editor told me that I could uh, I could go home again, but I couldn't stay for too long, um, so uh, I will be here for the next few minutes if people want to talk and, and sign books, and I know some of the other contributors will be as well. Um, I would be remiss if I did not say, uh, Mitch, you had something to say? I, yeah. Yes. This is our managing editor of the Seattle Times, and I just want to say a few words. Hi. Thank you. Hello. I'm so glad to be here tonight. Um, that was really moving. I don't know why I agreed to come up after. Um, all of you read so eloquently. Mark is asking me if I want to say a few words tonight. Um, I will say just a couple quick things. One is, um, Marcus and I struck up a friendship, uh, I don't know, a couple years ago maybe. I've admired what the Emerald does, and I've totally admired Marcus, um, even when they were calling out the Seattle Times. Um, and I think that's a really important mission for a publication like the Emerald. Um, and that's a big part of, of why I went after Marcus and hired him at the Times. Um, and I'm really excited about the work he's already doing and will do for us. Um, I think the main reason he wanted me to get up here and talk is to hold me accountable, probably, because um, uh, I'm hatching a little plan with him, which is starting after the first of the year to come out into South Seattle, maybe monthly or so, and have kind of just a casual conversation with people, um, to reach out and just listen. Like you were saying, just listen to people um, out here. I know that the Times is not always well regarded. Um, we've, we've tried over the years to get out in the world, represent the community in all of its richness and aspects. We kind of diversify our own staff to accomplish that. We've had ups and downs, successes and failures along the way. Um, we're really recommitted to doing that and doing it well. So, I plan to get out here personally um, once a month and invite people in different settings. We're still kind of figuring out the details. I committed to Marcus to do that. And like I said, I think the reason you want me to say it out loud here is because then I really will follow through. <laughs> um, life gets busy and, and um, I can all make excuses and now I'm on the record saying I'm gonna do that. So that's really all I need to say other than thank you to you, Marcus, for all you've done. Drink and be merry. Uh, do whatever you want to. If this place doesn't close until ten. So, um, thank you so much for being here again. Have a good night. Thank you. Beautiful, King. Appreciate you, brother. That was uh, that was remarkable.